heaven, we bless your name for our gathering together this day. Lord, we're asking that you will speak your word to our hearts and that you will give us receptive hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray in us to preach your word to others, that we will not be counted out as your word is preached to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us receptive hearts, Amen. understanding hearts, Amen. that will do exactly what you want us to do. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have looked at the program sheet, you will see that our program is virtually full. We spending such a short period of time together. It will be very necessary that you are in for all the sessions. We do not expect that any of our pastors, workers, or leaders that have come here would go to the town um, any time on your own without the time, apart from the time that all of us are going out together. You've come here for a purpose, and we want that purpose to be fulfilled. Then also, I want you to look through life in the camp on your own. And even though these things look familiar, I want you to read them and meditate upon them. And make sure that you live according to what is written here. The problem that we generally have in many churches is that ministers or preachers do not actually obey the word of God. That's why members of the different churches have given them the title that they are the do as I say, but not do as I do. And if we're not careful, the same tendency will come into the church here, that these things are written down. You could explain them to people at the retreat ground, but then you might find that you are not able to do them yourself. So go through on your own and make sure that you are living by them. Then this time we are printed on page 7, pages 7 and 8. Doctrines taught in the Bible church. We didn't say deeper life doctrines, but doctrines of the Bible for churches that want to pattern their lives, their doctrines, and their steps according to the Bible, the Word of God. And um, we expect that you should go through this uh, on your own. Not only when you are here, but generally at all times. Really, the ideal is that on any of these major doctrines, any minister of God in the church could be called at any time. With just maybe a two minutes notice that you are to preach on such and such. And it should be so conversant with the doctrines of the Bible, the major cardinal doctrines, that you shouldn't be wondering, what do I say on the great um, tribulation? Or what am I going to say on the millennial reign? These things should have been so much in you that you will have studied and known all these things um, on your own. This morning, we're dealing with holiness and heaven. I'm reading from Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse 1 to verse 5. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth this thing shall never be moved. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? 
He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up a soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The message of holiness, or the doctrine of holiness, is something that the average minister, the average preacher, in fact the average member with this church, would say that he or she is conversant with. But then it is good to go through and go over these familiar grounds again so that we we'll know whether we really did understand the message of holiness or not. And whether the life of holiness <coughs> is still the thing that we count as the most important. Already I read to you the word of God that links up holy living with living eternally with God at last. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Obviously you know David wasn't thinking of living in the tabernacle day and night on the face of the earth. When he said, Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? I'm sure you know he wasn't thinking about an individual packing away from home and going to live on a prayer mountain, the holy hill. He was talking about the people that will eternally live with God eventually. And even though he was a king, and he had been respected by the nation Israel. Not only that, other nations that had warred against Israel had recognized his name, had known him as a king. So talk about having position, a kingly position that he had, a political position that he had in his own nation. Now, you know, it's not easy for an individual to arrange so long, seven and a half years in Jerusalem and Judah, and then eventually about 33 years all over Israel, bringing it to a total of 40 years reigning. Even in Bible days, there were a few, just a few, that had that long period of time reigning over Israel. And of course, all the others did not have the recognition, the respect, the authority that David had. And for such a man to think about heaven, to feel all these things that I have got, the riches, the position, the power, the authority, will not amount to anything if I eventually miss heaven. And that's the way we ought to be thinking. Because possessions of the world are deceptive. In fact, somebody was talking to me, an American, and he was saying that he's looking for the time he'll have opportunity of inviting me to his church so that I could minister in his church. Then he said, when you come, you'll not only minister, I'll take you around. And you will find out why it may be difficult for me to die. That he once told God, he said, God, this seven we're talking about, I hope it's better than where I live now. And this is a minister who has been preaching for more than 28 years, Pentecostal. And yet he himself confessed that if I came over, I might discover why it would be difficult for him to die. And that when he prayed, he had asked God if heaven will be better than where he was. Now, think about that that sometimes we may become preachers and the positions we have, the property that we have, the privileges that we have, the recognition of people around us that we have may replace the desire to get to heaven. But think about whatever you have on earth. We'll talk about David. 
in a position of authority for only 40 years, even if you are there for 70 years. 70 years is something very, very small, intangible, inconsequential, when you think about eternity. So a minister of God, a child of God, should be thinking about eternity, that eventually the scroll will be rolled up. Eventually, time will come to an end for me and for you and for other people. And eventually, we'll be faced with the question whether or not we are prepared to meet our God. And as you listen to preachers of past generations, good preachers, Martin Luther, at his own time, the position that he had, in the church. You know, he would never perhaps have thought if it was like the generality of people that time will end. Think about people like John Wesley. Think about people like Spurgeon. Think about people like Charles G. Finney. They did so much. In fact, reading about their the memoirs of uh, their activities, their diaries, you would think um, they would never stop activity because life was too full for them of activities. But activities are deceptive. And we who are preachers uh, sometimes see the deception of activity, especially religious activity, that we get so busy that to eat may be difficult. To sleep may be something that uh, we do eat but then it's inconvenient because we think there is so much we do. And our whole system has got adjusted to activities and programs and preaching and counseling and praying that we just feel that that is life. But man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses, not only money. All the things that fill our lives. That's not life. So then, we should still be thinking about heaven. Heaven and holiness. The opposite, I could have said, hypocrisy and hell. On the one side, you have holiness, then you know that the end result is heaven. But on the other side, you have hypocrisy. You know the end result is hell. Now, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And then he goes on in verses 2, 3, 4, and 5 to say the people that have holiness. Now, what is holiness? Many times I've seen some of our preachers mention that word holiness, holiness so much. But then you begin to think, if we do not have a clear definition of holiness in our mind, in our understanding, we will not know when we have it. We will not know when we lose it. If you do not know the significance of, of a thing, or the meaning, the interpretation, the definition of that thing, just say, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. What is holiness? If you do not know what holiness is, how would you know when you have got it? And um, if you do not know what it is, if you got it before, how would you know when you have lost it? And you might just be going by the title that you are a holiness preacher without knowing the definition of that word holiness. And because you don't know it, you might be preaching it without possessing it. What then is holiness? Number one, holiness is simply godliness. It's the totality of the attributes of God in a child of God. It's the image of God explicitly seen and manifested in man. And when I see that the attribute of God is faithfulness, is goodness, is kindness, is very life, is duplicated, if you like, in me. When those attributes are manifest, are seen very clearly and very plainly in my life, then that means there is holiness in my life. Holiness is godliness. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 
verses 15 and 16. But as he which has called you is holy, as he, as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So then, if you are wondering in your mind, if I have this, how will I know? If I don't have it, how will I know? Simple. If you are like God, you are holy. If you are not like God, you are unholy. Well, to bring it still nearer, holiness is Christ-likeness. That's similar to the first definition, but then Jesus Christ came to live here. He interacted with people like we have to interact with people. He worked like we had to work. He preached a lot. He carried on the ministry of the preaching of the gospel. He healed. He delivered. He did a lot of things that we're called upon to do today. He was in leadership position as well. But in his life, in his ministry, in his leadership position, we saw, we've seen in the Bible, the life of Christ. And when I have Christ likeness that means i have holiness if i am like christ then i have holiness if i am unlike christ then i do not have holiness what does that mean that means i am christ-like in heart in attitude in disposition in motive in action many times when people talk about holiness they're only talking about external exterior things they're talking about being like christ in activity in action i do this i don't do this so you can see that everything the people are talking about is something you could measure in external terms the way i look the way i dress the way i walk the way i talk Everything that another person staying outside, not even having the Spirit of God, can easily judge and say, well, this man is swinging his hand as so-and-so swung his hand. This man is taking steps externally as that other man took steps. This man is dressing as this other person dressed. It's somebody that something that, is something that somebody can measure with external yardstick. That's only the action. But Christ-likeness is not just... Being like Christ in action, it starts with the heart. You are like Christ in heart, in attitude, in disposition. Now, all those three things, nobody can see. Now, that's why some people have misunderstood the message of holiness. And they say, well, you talk about holiness, and we don't talk so much about holiness, but looking at ourselves, well, when you look at yourself, you only see what you can measure externally. You won't see the heart. You won't see the attitude. You won't see the disposition. Looking at ourselves, in which way are we different? Are we not the same? We might not be the same. Holiness is something that starts from the heart. Being like Christ in the heart. In the attitude. In the disposition. In the motive. Before you ever come to the action. And now you must begin to ask yourself, the holiness I understand, the holiness I feel I possess, is it merely the action? Have I missed out the first four important areas where I ought to consider holiness? Am I holy in heart? Is my attitude Christ-like? Attitude to the Bible, to the Word of God? Attitude to the Holy Spirit, attitude to my responsibilities in the vineyard, attitude to the Heavenly Father and what He has sent me to do. Am I completely Christ like in attitude, in disposition? You know, um, there are people, they might not even be Christians, who can control themselves a lot. They may have the disposition of anger and bitterness and uh, real and they can repress it 
they can put all those things under subjection and still have the external sin. In fact, the psychologists will train people how to be in control of their emotions and be in control of everything. Now, they are not eradicating anything. They are not removing anything. They are not uprooting anything. So they can't really deal with the heart, the attitude, the disposition, the motive. But they can repress it. They can train you to understand how you can control yourself and not allow the anger, the bitterness, the malice to spill out. Well, that will not be Christ-likeness. And if that is all we're doing, that we call holiness, that isn't holiness at all. It will just boil down to the action. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, for such an high priest became us, talking about Jesus, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Such an high priest became us. That is only such an high priest could have atoned for our sins. Because he was holy. He was holy. Now, when you read about that, you might pass over that and just gloss over it, that Jesus Christ was holy. But what does it mean? He was the number one person that ever lived, that God, with all his instruments, spiritually, could examine as to whether he was holy or not, and could subject him to a thorough heavenly spiritual examination. He was the first person that was discovered by the Heavenly Father. He was holy through and through. Before Jesus came, there were people that were apparently holy. You know, we talk about Samuel. We talk about, you know, people like Joseph. We talk about a lot of other people. But to us, when we examine them, so we say, thank God, that somebody in the race of Adam could be this holy, like Joseph. Well, what do we learn from Joseph? The actions. As to the motives and the attitude and the heart and the disposition, all that will be in the hand of God. But we've seen the action of Joseph. That he was sold, he never fought back, and because he never exchanged blows, we thank God that's a holy man. That's our measuring yard. And then he went over uh, to uh, Egypt, and as he was there, whatever he had in the heart, that we're not told. But at least when this woman came and said, have this with me, he said, no, no, no. How will I sin against God and they do this terrible sin? Thank God, in the race of Adam, this is a person that we as human beings, we can look at and say, this man is holy. He went into the prison. While he was in the prison, he served. And he never mentioned all that he did against him. He kept quiet. And even when he met these uh, people, he said, when things are good for you, remember me. Because they just put me there. And he never talked about Potiphar and the wife. With our measuring yard, we praise the Lord. That a ra the race of Adam can produce a person like Joseph. And eventually, when the brethren came, and um, he said, you are spies. Well, we are preachers. And already we have made up our minds that Joseph is a holy man of God. Anything he did, we must put a good construction on it as preachers. And because we do not have many people like Joseph, so the few people we have, we must excuse them. But only God can tell. We measure the action. Oh yes, we say he wanted to check up who they were. Thank God, that's a good construction. That the action was all right. You are spies? No, I'm not spies. Okay, if you are not spies, I will test you. Then he locked them up. Well, as preachers who appreciate and love Joseph, 
And who were saying that uh, if I was compared with Joseph, where will I stand? So how can I be puncturing holes in the life of somebody better than, I'm, better than I am? So it's the holy man of God. But only God can tell the heart, the attitude, the disposition, the motive, the actions, good. Now, for Samuel, we thank God for Samuel. How can I stand here and tell you that Samuel wasn't holy? Of course, by the way we measure things, Samuel was holy. But what I'm saying is this. In the race of Adam, when God examined everybody, Jesus was the only person and the first person <coughs> that was transparently holy and completely holy in his lifetime, completely. Whether in the wilderness, or in the home, or in the synagogue, or on the mountaintop, or on the street, even when he achieved um, you know, great, um, a great name, great prophet, we knew that he would not have had pride. And the Holy Spirit says, such a high priest became us, who is holy and harmless and undefiled, separate from sinners. You know, with our own measuring yard, we will not say that Jesus was separate from sinners. Because uh, he ate with them. And yet, God is saying he was the first person the only person that ever separated from sinners the way he, God, wanted his own children to be separated from sinners. And yet, we have seen people like John the Baptist, in our own measuring yard, externally, we would have said John the Baptist qualified more than Jesus Christ in separating from sinners. We have seen Elijah, in our own measuring yard, we would have felt that Elijah separated from sinners more than Jesus did. He'll never eat with them. He'll never converse with them. Anytime he came, he was bringing the judgment of God, and once he brought it, he faded off again. He lived his life separate from sinners. You see, when we just measure it by actions alone, and we do not think of the heart, the attitude, the disposition, the motive, we think that, We've got it when we might not have got it at all. Separate from sinners made higher than the heavens. I was telling you this, that holiness is Christ-likeness. It is the character of Christ in the new creature. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, For even here unto what ye called, because Christ also has suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. That verse has been grossly misunderstood. Grossly misunderstood. We have read the book, perhaps, in his steps. And the writer has pictured how Jesus would have behaved in a situation. If Jesus was a servant, how he would have behaved. If Jesus was a nurse, how he would have behaved. If Jesus were in our situation, in our profession. If Jesus were to live the life we live today, how he would have behaved. And the author of that book has given us the external actions of Jesus Christ. That, look, Jesus Christ would have walked like this, moved like this, slept like this, prayed like this, done this, all that you can measure in external outward actions. And, you know, the song we sing, uh, we say, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to dress like Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to pray like Jesus, to heal like Jesus, to sleep like Jesus, to talk like Jesus. Have you noticed that that song is just action? Action part. That you pray, 
Just make sure that your action relates with the action of Jesus Christ. You eat, you dress, you sleep, you walk, you talk, everything, external action. It says nothing about the heart of Jesus, the attitude of Jesus, the disposition deep, deep down within of Jesus Christ, nor the motives of Jesus Christ. How can we measure that? How can we think about that? All we know is that once I am externally like Jesus, I am holy. And we might be the most unholy creatures on the face of the earth. Eating like Jesus. Fasting like Jesus. Praying like Jesus. Being quiet like Jesus. Just, you know, walking very quietly. Externally like Jesus Christ. And we might not have good motives, good hearts, good disposition at all. So then, holiness is not just the steps that, you know, that author has written about. It's not just something external. It is something internal to start with. That's why Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, He whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now this goes beyond his steps. Not just in his steps, but having the very image, so that we are conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Of course, if we are conformed to the image of his son internally, then we'll be conformed to the life of the Son outwardly. First John chapter 2, verse 6. He that says he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he was. But the first point is abiding in him. Not just um, coming and copying Jesus Christ. The way he taught, the way he lived, the way he dressed, the way he did this, the way he did that. So then, what is Christ's likeness? We've seen in the Bible that the character of Jesus Christ uh, can be explained with these words. Number one, he was righteous. And I didn't say he was self-righteous. You know, the righteousness you have to justify is not righteousness. The white garment, I have to argue and debate upon that. Look, this garment is white. That garment really is not white. If I have to debate about it, if I have to explain it, if I have to uh, defend the whiteness of that cloth, that cloth is not white enough. When it is white enough, it doesn't need a professor from the university to come and tell us it is white. If righteousness has to be defended, it's self-righteousness. Jesus' righteousness was the true type of righteousness that you didn't need to defend. It was there. And Jesus Christ, one, he was righteous. Number two, he was good. Just good. Without any ulterior motives. How do we know that? He cleansed that leper. And he said, don't you tell any man. Go and tell them only at the uh, synagogue. Go and tell the priests. He was to heal a blind man. He drew him out of the city and then he healed his eyes and then he said, go back. Uh, don't go back to those people but go to another place. Don't tell them anything. And um, he fed the hungry and then at the pool of Bethesda, when that important man was there, he got in there and he healed that man of 38 years of infirmity. After that, he went away. That man carried his bed, and the Jews said, Who told you to carry your bed? He said, The man that healed me. What's his name? He didn't tell me. You can see the motive of Jesus Christ in doing good. He wasn't doing it to gain anything. He just did good. That's being good. That's what we call holiness. It's not just the action. It is what is behind the action that makes that action to be holiness. Now you begin to understand that a sinner can give out money to the beggars. Somebody who is born again can give out money to the beggars. 
Somebody who is sanctified can give money to the beggars. Somebody who is dying now and has seen the angels coming to take him home can say, you beggars, now I'm going home, take money. Now all of the four people are giving money to the beggars, but you can see the, the differences in their hearts. The sinner is giving it out. The sick man is giving it out. The sanctified is giving it out. Now the man that knows that I'm going out, these are angels waiting for me to carry me home. He's giving money to the beggars. They are, di they are all different. It's not the action. It's what's behind the action. That we call holiness. Jesus Christ was holy. He was righteous. He was good. And so when we talk about Christ-likeness in us, we're talking about the holiness that God demands. Righteous, good, compassionate. Well, Jesus didn't weep every time. He wept at Lazarus' grave. Many people don't know why he wept. So it's no, it's no use debating the issue on that case. But he was more compassionate than all the people that have lived in the world before he came who wept every day for everything that happened to other people. It is not weeping that we call being compassionate. Again, it's the heart attitude. For long, we have misunderstood holiness to be something we could measure externally. We couldn't measure it with the instruments of God, but only with our own instruments. He was righteous, good, compassionate. He was faithful. Faithful to God, his Father. He lived under the concept and the principle, my Father who sent me is always with me. He's looking at what I do. And of course, he knew the Father so much that he knew that uh, the Father will not just be looking for action. The Father will be looking at the heart, the motive, the disposition, the attitude, everything together. Then he was honest. He was just. And very considerate. Very considerate. You know, even in his um, zeal that his disciples should serve the Lord, save the lost, care for the dying, he was also still considerate about their lives. He said, you come apart so that you can rest a little while. And that's part of the character of Jesus Christ. Very, very considerate. Always considerate. Always. And he was innocent and harmless. He was meek. He was lowly. You know, when I thought about all these things looking at the Bible, and I felt Jesus Christ to be lowly and to be meek, you know, in our own understanding, especially when you become like a general superintendent, when you become the pastor of what they say is the largest church in Africa, when you hear testimonies, uh, you know, the man of God prayed for me and I have this, I add this, I add that, the average person might think that that type of man doesn't need meekness or lowliness or humility anymore. I mean, what, what do you need humility for? When, you know, people know that if they just, if they have a touch from you, they get healed. If they have this, uh, if they need this, you pray to God on their behalf, you have it, you have crusades, you pastor a church, you control people, you do this, you do that. But can we ever be higher than Jesus Christ? What position can any minister have in the church of God? that will be higher than the position of Jesus Christ. The highest who are called in the New Testament was apostles. And those apostles were still thousands of miles below Jesus Christ. Even Peter, even John, even Andrew, any of those people, thousands of miles below Jesus Christ. And then Jesus said, even to sinners, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he said, Sinners, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. What are we to learn of you? 
I am meek and lowly. Can you tell sinners that? And allow them to climb on you, step on you, tread upon you. Won't you, you know, be, use the big name every time for respect, for honor, for recognition? Sometimes, you know, we were told outside, that's at school, the higher you go, the cooler you become. And I think it's true spiritually. The higher you go, the cooler you become. The less humble you become. The less holy you become. The less lowly you become. Because we think that now I'm apostle, now I am general superintendent, now I'm sorry, state rep, now I'm state representative. You know, we, we get offended. If the word of God will touch us, after all, I am the great man of God in my own stage. But holiness means that we are like Jesus Christ. And if you can't hold a position and be like Jesus Christ at the same time, drop that position for the alternative of being like Jesus Christ. And say, I will prefer to be like Jesus Christ and lose everything that will make me contrary to living the life of Christ. That's Christianity. But if position takes Christ away from you, takes the life, the characteristics, the attitudes of Jesus Christ away from you, that position has robbed you. It has stabbed you. It has done to you what the devil had wanted to do long, long ago. He didn't have a chance to do. And if it is church position that makes us not to be meek again, not to be lowly again, then we're in for trouble. Now, a person that doesn't get lost through the hotel, and he gets lost through the pulpit, which one is worse? The one that gets lost through the hotel, well, we know she, she will be lost. But the one that gets lost through the pulpit, that's unfortunate. Holiness is Christ-likeness. Being like Jesus Christ in heart, in attitude, in disposition, in motive, in action. And I said, Jesus is righteous, good, compassionate, faithful, truthful, and honest, just and considerate, innocent, harmless, meek, and lowly. And Jesus was patient. Patient. You know, many times I've watched some holy people. In our own church, I know about our people here. You know, we preach a message, maybe on holiness, and they consecrate, and they just say, Lord, we're going to be holy. Then we finish that service. Then they need to go home. And they want to get home in time. And they rush. They do not know whether somebody is before them or behind them. They get into the bus, and the way they act, you will know that their holiness does not have patience in it. They do not understand what holiness really is. Even our people here, the great majority of them, and I'm preaching this same thing to them sometimes, so they can understand. But we have to understand first, because we are called leaders. That's what we are called. Sometimes it's better not even to be called all these names because they rob us of what we ought to be. But that's what they call us. But then, if we do not understand it ourselves, how can we go to these people here, the congregation, and begin to tell them, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And we do not even understand what holiness is all about. But in holiness, there is patience. Now, I've just given you an illustration of our people that are rushing for both to get home. But that's a small thing. Here we are. We are all rushing for our church to become 5,000. And we become so impatient. Impatient with God. We we'll go to God and say, God, 
I'm serving you and I'm preaching the sound doctrine. I'm doing as much as so and so. The moment you say that, is that the characteristic of Jesus? Now God, what are you looking at? I pray, I fast. If this church does not become um, 5,000 at the end of this year, it means that you are not a faithful God. Who are you talking to God like that? Are you the savior of the sinners? That's impatient. How about Elijah? Even these people that we say examined by God, they were not holy enough. Elijah was told to go and stay at the brook. And for one whole year he was there. Not preaching a single message. You know, people feel that if you have been a prophet, you have been a preacher, you must preach every day. There's nothing like that in the Bible. In fact, it's likely that if you are preaching every day, and if it's not the will of God, you'll dry up faster than the tree that is cut down. You won't have any sap in you. But there are people that just like activities. You know, just preach and preach. And that man was just patient there, Elijah. Then when the book dried up, sent him to the house of a widow. He stayed in the house of that widow. And then some other years passed by again. Think about that. But many of us, right now, God, don't bring your name to shame. I want to pray for the blind and they must see. Why must they see? Give the reason why they must see. Well, because so that people will know you have raised me up. There you are. That's your reason. Why blind eyes must be opened. So that people will see that this church is a special church. There you are. That's your reason. And so that our church members will see the result of my fasting all these days. There we are. Not because of doing good to that man that was blind. Not because God will take the glory. And you know that when you pray for the blind and their eyes are not open, you know you feel hurt. You feel depressed. One thousand people might come forth to receive the Lord as their personal savior. With one mouth or one, one corner of your mouth, you say, salvation is the greatest miracle. And one thousand have come and they have got the greatest miracle. And because two blind people were there that were not healed, you are offended. Offended at God. Is it your work? What's your problem? And you'll even abuse God. God, what are you looking at? You see your mate? What is he looking at? Are you the creator of that blind man? What's happening to you? And we're impatient. But we say we are holy. Jesus was patient. How about getting married? Holiness preachers? How about in our homes? Between husband and wife? You know, holiness preachers? The food has not come yet. And we storm into the kitchen. Say, so what are you looking at? What are you doing? This is what I've been telling you. And um, I don't want to get angry. <laughs> he doesn't want to get angry. And the wife will say, well, I'm coming. It will soon be ready. Make it soon. Make it soon. Because hunger cannot enter and another thing will enter in the life of a holiness preacher. Your own preachers like you, they fasted 40 days. And you can't miss a meal. You must get angry because the food is not ready yet. Why are we deceiving ourselves? Jesus was patient. That's what we call holiness. He was long-suffering. He was forgiving. Forgiving. Now, you are an individual. You may preach. That's something about you. That's not you. You may sing. That's something about you. That's not you. And as an individual, you must know that your life is important to God. Loving and forgiving. What can people do against you? 
And you know, there are holiness preachers that will, you know, grumble, complain, talk to their friends, so and so did this against me. And some people can waste a whole year. Nothing the grudge. This is what so and so did. And they are holiness preachers. And when you preach about sanctification, they are not going to pray again. Oh, they have been sanctified in 1978. They were sanctified once and forever. And whatever they do now, except smoking and drinking, except adultery and fornication, whatever they do now, it doesn't matter. They may be impatient, they may be covetous, they may be proud, they may be aggressive, they can do anything. They were sanctified many, many years ago. Is that Bible? We must watch our lives and understand it is not what we do, it is what we are that matters before God. And Jesus was self denying, he was humble, he was obedient to God, merciful, and then he was he resisted temptation. So, what is holiness? Holiness is number one, godliness, the attributes of God in a child of God, the image of God expressly seen and manifest in man. What is holiness? Holiness is Christ-likeness in heart, in attitude, in disposition, in motive, in action. What is holiness? Number three, holiness is Christ's sermon demonstrated and understood in us. Holiness is shown in the life of Jesus Christ being in our lives now. But more than that, you've seen the messages of Jesus Christ, especially the Sermon on the Mount. What then is holiness? Holiness is Christ's sermon, manifested in us and demonstrated through us, understood in us, so that if people read Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7, and they do not understand, if they take Matthew Henry's commentary and they do not understand still Matthew's, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and they take even John Wesley's commentary and they cannot understand the commentary and the explanation of the Sermon on the Mount, the last thing for them to do is to look at a holy man and they will get an explanation of the Sermon on the Mount. That's holiness. That means then, it's a life that is an approved commentary on Christ's Sermon on the Mount. That's holiness. Holiness is the approved commentary, approved by God, approved commentary on Christ's Sermon on the Mount. Breaking that down, explaining that, what will that mean? It will mean, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, we'll go through chapters 5, 6, and 7. Looking at <coughs> the chapter, it means that such a holy person is meek and merciful. That's verses 5 and 7. Not only that, he is pure and he is peacemaking. That's in verses 8 and 9. He has joy in tribulation. If he doesn't, then his life is not an approved commentary on Christ's Sermon on the Mount, and therefore, it's less than a holy life. He has joy in tribulation. He is sought to preserve his immediate community from corruption. He is light to protect or preserve his immediate community from darkness. That's holiness. Then as we go on in the other part of the chapter, chapter 5, you will see that it means that he has freedom from anger. Then he has freedom from lust. Then he's free from any attitude or spirit of retaliation. Then he is free from deceit. In his heart, he never has an intention, a disposition, an attitude to deceive. His yes is 
coming out of the depth of his heart and in the bottom, the deepest part of his heart, it is yes. And he has yes deep within before the mouth will verbalize the word yes. His yes is truly yes. His nay is truly nay. Then is free from revenge and hatred. Not only that, he is full of love, love to God, love to fellow man, love to even enemies. In chapter 6, he is free from hypocrisy. Every form of hypocrisy is free from me. Chapter 6 is free from covetousness. And in chapter 6, the man that is holy is free from worry and anxiety. Is free from the fear of future. And if you read white, you have read of holiness people, so called, that's just the name. And that's the name they enjoy, you call them with. That's their own denominational pride, that they are holiness people. You have read of holiness people that have worry and anxiety. They worry about tomorrow. They worry about the future. They are afraid of what will happen to them tomorrow. What will happen to even their children not yet born. They are worried about everything. And yet, they will talk about being holy. No. Holiness is Christ's sermon. Demonstrated, manifested, and also understood and seen in us. And if that is so, it means that the one that has the holiness experience doesn't have worry and anxiety. Have you found some people that say they believe in holiness and they, they went out? While they are coming back, they didn't uh, see the wife at home. Maybe the wife just uh, discovered uh, after he went out that there was no salt or there was no pepper or no oil and said, before my husband comes, let me run to the market there and get this thing. And then he was around, holiness preacher. And uh, before the wife came, just about 10 minutes, he's been wondering what happened. Ah, so this is how this woman goes out. There must be some men in her life. Maybe she's going to do this, she's going to, she's going to do that. She's afraid she's going to lose that wife. And then uh, the wife uh, came back with uh, some groceries in hand. And uh, we'll say, where are you coming from? I just went to the... No, no, no. You just went to market to buy that thing to camouflage, to cover up. You went to another place. You must tell me. You must make restitution. No, sir, I didn't go anywhere. No, you went somewhere. The soul that sinners shall die. Afraid that the wife has gone to do something outside. Suspicion. Worry, anxiety, and our minds are never with God wherever we are. We feel that those people must be doing this against me now. Those people must be doing something against me now. They must be planning this and this and that now. The life is in fear. Worry and anxiety, that's not holiness. It's not holiness at all. If we talk about holiness, we're talking about the sermon on the mount. Sin very clearly in our lives. And there will be no worry. There will be no anxiety. You ask the person, where are you coming from? I'm coming from the market. Okay, God bless you. I didn't know you went to the market. Suppose they went to another place. Fine. I won't take her to heaven when I die. I'll go and she'll go on her own. If she told the lies between her and God, I'm not God, you can lie to me if you want to. But you shouldn't lie to God. So what's my problem? Why am I making myself God? And I must find out this person is lying to me. Okay, suppose he's lying to me. What does that do? That's between him and God. That's between her and God. When he hears the word of God, then he'll make right his life with God. But we're worried, we're anxious, and we say we're holy. And this holiness, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord and we do not know what's, the, what's even the meaning of this holiness we're talking about. I told you it is freedom from fear of the future. 
It is freedom from a critical, judgmental attitude. I'm sure you've seen, uh, you know, preachers like yourself, and perhaps you've seen yourself also, so being very critical, judgmental, and you will talk of being holy. And even while you are talking about that holiness within your heart, you are so critical of people around you. Well, you may cover it up and give reasons for it, but then holiness will set you free from all that. And then holiness is the constant operation of the golden rule. As I want others to do unto me, so I do unto them likewise. It is freedom from falsehood, from false prophets and false doctrines. And it is the consistent, unreproachable behavior. All that you will see in the Sermon on the Mount. And remember again, holiness is godliness. Holiness is Christ's likeness. Holiness is Christ's Sermon on the Mount, explained through the life of this man that has got the experience of holiness. We know that we are commanded to be holy. What's the command? That's what I read to you before. In First Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. First Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Because I am holy. That means we must be right with God, acceptable in His sight, in fellowship with Him, and that cannot be if we neglect this great command. Yet, there's something within us we must accept that perpetually hinders what we might call perpetual inability in man to be holy. That's why Christ came and Christ has given us his provision of divine enablement. We need to pray, we need to ask, we need to consecrate, and we need to show God the need that we actually know that we need it. Because if you do not pray about it, you do not tell God that you need it, you say, well, uh, God, I thank you, like uh, the Pharisee that came to God. God, I thank you, I'm not like other men. And that has been our prayer. Every time the Pharisees pray, we come to church and our pastor will stand up and say, uh, praise the Lord, this is Deeper Life Bible Church. And the people are happy. Oh yes, we're the special, the unique church. We are not like other people. Amen, amen. We are not extortioners. We don't drink. We don't smoke. We don't wear this. We don't wear that. We are the people of God. And this deeper life, praise the Lord, we are not like other people. Amen. Clap for Jesus. You are clapping for yourself. Not like other men. And you know, we carry that attitude everywhere we go, even in the presence of God. Oh God, I thank you, I'm deep alive. Oh God, I thank you, I'm a Pharisee. The same thing. Not like other people. We don't chew this, we don't drink that, we don't wear this, we don't wear that. We get angry. We have jealousy. We have envy. We have this uh, terrible canal competition, but thank God we are not like other people. Our church is pure. Amen. Amen. Our church is good. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure of what you are saying. Leave the judgment of whether your church is good or not to the last day. Only God can judge. What's church? It's not the building. The church is the people. Well, the people, all you can see is what is absent in their ears. You don't see what is absent in their heart. There's a difference. All you can see is, you know, the dress. But you cannot see the real dress of the inner man. 
Stop all this uh, pride, thinking that you are better than the other churches. Jesus said that the harlots and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before these Pharisees. And when the centurion came, he said, I have not found faith, no, not in Israel. And you know, if you read Luke chapter 7, the Jews, they sent to Jesus, and they thought that they were nearer Jesus than the centurion. And they said, Jesus, this man is worthy of whom you should do something, because he loved our nation, and he built a temple for us. So, we are pleading for him. You know, these people that were pleading for him were unworthy before God. And he said, you people that are pleading, I tell you, the people will come from the east and the west and the south and they will get into the kingdom. And you children of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. Then he faced them and he said, Centurion, you are unique, you are different. Even among all these people that you built temple for, I've not seen anybody like you. Go home, be it unto you according to your faith. It might surprise you when we get to heaven. If we get there, that the Anglicans, some of them, not everybody, it's not everybody in the Anglican that will get to heaven, just like it's not everybody in deeper life that will get to heaven. I'm sure you know that. That you'll see Anglicans and Methodists and Baptists and Catholics and get into the kingdom before deeper life people. And when they want to enter, there will be no question at all. Oh, child of God, just come in. And then when the deeper life person gets there, you will watch. Because we're going to be at the gate. And they look at him. And you say, what's happening? When the Anglican was going on, they didn't question him. Just said, just, just move in, just move in, keep moving. But now I, I come in there, no jewelry and good dressing and, you know, all these things. And they're examined saying, should you get in? Do you not get in? Does grace cover all his, uh, you know, all his uh, carnality? Jesus, come and attend to your boy. And then eventually, maybe they say, okay, let him get him, but no reward. And then over there, there will be no pride of, uh, you know, I'm deeper life, I'm this and that. All that is human. All that is the gimmicks, the game, the religious game that we pay, play here to get crowd. You know, we're better than so and so. That's just the game to, you know, get more people to sit down on Sunday morning. Just to sit down on Sunday morning. What happens to them while they're sitting down? You don't have any way of telling. That's just getting the crowd. But after the gimmicks are over, after the religious games are over, to so now get to heaven. That's why we ought to check up. Christ has made the provision. He can make us holy if we want to. But if we tell God and we say, God, uh, regardless of what has been preached, I am holy enough, God will say, all right. Since you are not like other men, you are all right, you are all right. But the other people that come, like the public and saying, Lord, be merciful unto me. He didn't introduce himself. Lord, I am so and so. I have this, I have this, I have this, and then later say, God, uh, but I'm not good enough, even though uh, I thank you because I am this, I am this, I am this, but also cleanse me. You'll never be cleansed that way. And I'm sure, Citrus, you don't mind my telling you this, I'm your leader. You don't go before God and say, God, I thank you. I'm a state representative. I preached in that place, I preached in that place, I preached in that place. Now my church that was just uh, 2,000 last year, we're now clocking 4,000. God, am I not doing well? And God, remember, I never went to seminary. And look at what I've done. And I didn't go to all these, uh, you know, crusades and things. And when I hold crusades now and blind eyes open, but uh, God, the holiness, they talk about this. Oh, lest I forget, God the people that were reaching now in our state, my, my. When we get to heaven, God, I have testimonies to give you. Things you don't know that I'm going to tell you what happened in our state. But uh, God, a preacher preached this morning and talked about holiness. Give it to me. Make me holy. You'll never get it. 
if God is going to make an ass holy, the ass that Balaam is riding, he'll never give it to that man that will come before him and pride himself in what he has done, what he has achieved, what he has gone through, before telling God that I want to get holy. He can purify animals instead of such men. But you know, if you come before God and say, God, is heaven I am aiming for. And I want to give myself to you. I don't care what people think about me. I just want to talk to you. Because, who knows, we talk about the second coming of the Lord. He might come while we're listening to preaching. He might come after the preaching. We have been saying it every time, but many of us don't realize it may happen that way. And some of us who don't like to pray when others are around, because we are leaders. I thank God if, uh, if I'm in a place and I'm hearing a message, if I feel like crying, I don't look at people and say, well, uh, that person is there. They will, they will know that uh, I am a backslider. What's their business with my life? If I'm a backslider, that's my business. If I want to settle with God, that's my business completely. If they will not accept me as their pastor after I settle with God, let them go with the church and let me go to heaven. But what am I fighting for? Are you fighting for, I want to hold that position, hold that position? What do you want to do with position? On heavy lies the head that wears the crown. You want to die? <laughs> What's the problem? If there is no position, why not say praise the Lord? If holiness is there without position, I'm going to heaven in any case. That's the most important thing. There must be consecration. You give yourself to the Lord. Now, I said, although our time is gone, holiness and heaven, when you are holy, you get heaven. But think about this. That heaven starts right here for a holy man. Maybe you didn't hear that before. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 21. That your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. Now, when we get to heaven, what are we looking for? We're going to be happy in heaven. A happiness in heaven. Do you know what happens on earth for the man that is holy? He has a good measure of a happy life here. And a man that doesn't think what you think about him, what you say about him, he doesn't worry whether the position is there or the position is gone. He doesn't worry for property. He doesn't worry for name. He doesn't worry for anything. Only to serve the Lord and be holy to the Lord, that man is a happy man. And that happiness, the happiness of heaven, starts right here. But it's the people that are looking for something that are never happy. They are up and down. You take a little money from them, you know, they, they get so unhappy. And they lose a little thing, they get so unhappy. But the man that is holy, and the only thing that he's looking for in life is godliness, Christ likeness, and Christ someone on the mount uh, demonstrated in his life. He worries about nothing. And he has that happiness right here. And then when he gets to heaven, he has a greater uh, level of happiness. When you get to heaven, there will be joy. But the man that is holy has that joy right here. When you get to heaven, there will be uninterrupted peace. The man that is holy right here on earth, he has that uninterrupted peace. The peace of God that passes understanding. Nothing of all say. This thing may happen, that thing may happen. He still has the peace of God. Because of the centrality of holiness in his life. When you get to heaven, you will be in the immediate presence of God. When you are holy today, the presence of God is given to you to favor you. When you get to heaven, there will be freedom from evil, freedom from oppression, freedom from Satan's dominion. And Satan fears to touch a really holy man. Think about it. Not the people that are making positive confessions. You see a lot of people going about saying, I'm a child of God, Satan cannot touch me. And you ask them very closely. The devil is tormenting them. Will press them on the bed at night. And will do a lot of things. But the people that are really holy, and they are put on Christ, and they are wearing the garment of righteousness, 
within and without, they are holy, they are pure. They are right in the presence of God every time. When they begin to pray, the Lord is standing very close. Before they finish, he's giving them answers to their prayers. Because these are people that care nothing for us, nothing for anything that is carnal or worldly. All they want is the glory of God. God is nearer, Satan is farther away. When you get to heaven, there will be days of freedom from evil, from oppression, from Satan's dominion. But if you are holy as you are right here. Now, I'm sure you, you are saying, I know many holiness people. I know many people are sanctified that are, you know, being oppressed of the devil. No, sir. You know people that belong to churches where they preach sanctification. There's a difference there. You know people that read tracts on holiness. There is a difference. You know people that talk about, uh, you know, I am holy, I am sanctified, and they give a date to when they were sanctified, and the devil is suppressing them. That's different. I'm talking about people that are really holy. People that are holy. And when Satan looks at them, he sees Jesus in them. He doesn't see them. The devil can't touch them. Because the devil knows, if you touch this man, if you make him sick, he's not going to abuse God, he's not going to backslide, he's not going to do anything. If you kill him, he's going to say, praise the Lord, I'm getting to heaven faster than I, than I suppose. That for me, sudden death is sudden glory. He doesn't care about us or money or anything. All he wants is just God. When am I going to see your face? When am I coming home? Now, if you torment such a man, what have you got to gain? You beat a man that doesn't care for the beating. You take money from a man that doesn't care for Naira. Or you take a friend from a man that doesn't care for any friend except Jesus. Whom have I on earth except you? And in heaven except you. And when he gets to heaven, he's not looking for cow, he's not looking for gold, he's not looking for mansion, he's not looking for anything. Only to look at the face of Jesus and say thank you. And if he has to say thank you every day for eternity, he is happy. What, have you, what are you going to do to such a man? The devil cannot touch the man that is now having the life of Christ duplicated, demonstrated in him. And you know, when you get to heaven, this is what you are going to get. And you are getting it right here. The man that is holy is the man that is healthy. When we get to heaven, there will be no more curse. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more pain. But think about it. The man that is really holy, will he have hypertension? Now, in our churches today, don't we have workers that are dying of hypertension? What causes hypertension? Is it not worry? and anxiety? What causes stroke? Is it not sudden fear? Now, if we are holy and there is no anger, no animosity, no bitterness, no hatred, no quarreling, no grudge, and, uh, you know, there is no comparison, and there is no shock, there is no fear, there is nothing, how is the man that is holy going to have hypertension? A man that is not running for contracts. A man that is not going to say, well, I'm so disappointed. They didn't give me the contract and I don't know what I've done. Oh, God, I fasted. Oh, God, I prayed. Oh, God, what are you looking at? All these contracts I didn't get. A man that is not looking for contracts, if he gets it, praise the Lord. If he doesn't get it, glory be to your holy name. How can a man like that have a hypertension? But the people will say are holy and we're getting hypertension and we're getting stroke. And we are getting other problems, torments of the devil. Why? We should re-examine this holiness we are talking about. Because the prince of this world cometh, and he findeth nothing in me. What will he hold on to? So then, a man that is holy, when you get to heaven, there will be complete hell. You will be totally healthy, but here you will be healthy. You don't smoke, you don't drink. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, always happy, always going about them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Any problem? No problem at all. You have any worry? No worry at all. And you are merry, and the word of God is in your heart all the time. And the word of God that is in your heart all the time, it will be medicine to your navel, medicine to your body, health to your body. The man that is holy is a healthy man. Then, he will have a lot of inheritance here on earth. 
He is fulfilling God's conditions. And God has said, if you are like this, this is what I will do. If, if you are like this, this is what I will do. And all those conditions he has fulfilled, it's just a matter of going to God in prayer and saying, God, this is what your word says. This is what you say you will do to such and such a person. Now do this, and the thing is done. They would all be enjoyed. All these things we're going to enjoy in heaven will be enjoyed in some measure now through holiness. Holiness and heaven starting from right here. Well, already we have explained all these things. It's just that somebody has to explain them. If I had the opportunity, I should have been sitting where you are sitting and another person standing up here to tell all of us. But even though I'm standing here, I hear what I say. Like you are hearing what I'm saying. And as I hear, I ought to judge myself. As you hear, you ought to judge yourself. Because my brothers and sisters, when we get to heaven, and we are to be allowed to enter, I won't enter before you on the basis of being generous superintendent of deeper life. I will enter on the basis of without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. Rise up and let us pray. Our Father, we come before the altar this morning that you might once again examine us thoroughly. We know we need a fresh forging so that we can serve you the way you want us to serve you. You have shared to all with us this morning your mind because without holiness no preacher can get to heaven. And there is no pastor or any Christian worker for that matter that we make it. You have revealed to us that holiness is not just in the outward action. It is in the heart, in our attitude, in our disposition, and in our motives. It is being like God, godliness in the children of God. It is being like Christ, Christ-likeness, having the character of God in all our hearts, in our attitude, in our dispositions, in our motives, and in every totality of our lives. Father, none of us can say we are what you want us to be yet. But we know that we need to be perfected by, by your word and by your power. That's why I say, Lord, that this day we are before the altar. As we consecrate that your holy hand might touch us in our very heart, so that we become what you want us to be, mighty Father. As we say we are sorry for all the errors and mistakes we have been uh, committing, we pray that this day, you might make us, holy, make us holy in Jesus' name. We are before the altar. We don't want to leave here before until you have done a great thing in our lives. And we know our coming here is for this purpose. And so before we leave here on Saturday morning, dear Lord, we pray that what you have begun now, you will complete it in Jesus' name. So that we leave here humble, lowly, innocent, completely changed in our hearts and in our lives in Jesus' name. Faithful is he who has promised, who also will do it. Visit us anew and help us that whatever we hear, we'll not just hear it and forget, but it will remain indelible in our hearts in Jesus' name. We need much to seek your, uh, your, your will and your faith under this meeting. And so as we live here from time to time, Lord, help us to pray, to re-examine our lives, and to completely open up ourselves before you. Because we know that only then 
you can perfect your will in our lives. So help us to surrender completely in Jesus' name. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name we pray. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb.